What's up, everybody? Welcome to this special edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show. I know it's a Monday and usually it's not a special edition because I'm coming at you three times a week over the digital airwaves of YouTube each Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the very least. But damn it, I'm on vacation. So I ain't supposed to be working at all. But you know what? I missed y'all. I truly, truly did. And I had some things on my mind. So I figured if I had the time available to me, the least I could do is take some time to express myself in a variety of ways. One of those ways would be thanking you yet again for the love and support that you continue to show the show because we have now eclipsed over 593,000 subscribers, closing in on 600,000 subscribers, which I suspect we will be reaching in a matter of days. That's number one. Number two, to remind you to grab a hold of my new book. It ain't that new, but it's a New York Times best seller and it's now in paperback. That part is new. It's called Straight Shooter, a memoir of second chances and first takes that you can now go to straightshooterbook.com to grab that straightshooterbook.com to grab. And obviously, I appreciate you continuing to like and follow the show. In order to do that, just click the bell right there and you too will be the latest subscriber and the latest member of the Stephen A. Smith Show family. Let's get right to it right now because we've got some NBA items to get into along with a plethora of other things. Trust me on this. But the first order of business is the Golden State Warriors and the one and only Steph Curry. They've got problems, ladies and gentlemen. They've got big problems. We've got to get started with the NBA, okay? Because the Warriors are in a fight to make the play in leading Houston, as in the Houston Rockets, by just one game for the final spot. The Rockets, in case y'all have missed it, have won eight straight games. By the way, this is bad news for Klay Thompson because when you look at the Rockets and they're threatening to get into the play and at the expense of the Golden State Warriors, Klay Thompson is now coming off the bench and in the final year of his contract. So it's a contract year approaching, all right? As of last night, some of the observers questioned head coach Steve Kerr who decided to only play Steph Curry 30 minutes in a 114-110 loss to the Minnesota Timberwolves. Before I get into any of that, here's what Steve Steph Curry had to say about all of that. I want to play as many minutes as, as I'm fresh and able to. They were just going on a run. Um, it was The lead was kind of weathering away. So, you know, we played the whole fourth quarter in India against Indiana. It didn't work out. This didn't work out. So we got to find somewhere in the middle. I got something to say. I truly, truly do. But it wouldn't be fair if I spoke before we heard from Steve Kerr himself, who defended Stephen Curry's low minute total, saying, quote, we're trying to keep him around 30 minutes, trying to get him as much rest as we can. As long as we're hanging in there, then we wanted to limit the minutes a little bit. If you want to say that him playing 30 minutes instead of 32 was the difference in the win or the loss. I totally disagree with that, end quote. I can't disagree with Steve Kerr. First of all, let's understand something. Two minutes does not make that big of a difference. Secondly, Steve Kerr is a four-time champion as the head coach. He's guided them to six, six, titles, six title appearances in eight years. The man is a hell of a coach. He's one of the top five coaches in the history of basketball. I'm not going to get on him about that, but what I will say is this. Desperate times are desperate measures. And let me be very, very clear about what I'm about to say. The dynasty is over. Change is coming. There's no way that Joe Lake of the owner, Peter Goober, the owner for the Golden State Warriors, is going to sit here and tolerate what we've been witnessing this year. They're a mediocre team. They're a mediocre team, and they're not in Big D like everybody wants to say when I'm talking about the Dallas Cowboys. Mediocre team in Big D. No, 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 no. They ain't Golden State. And the reality of the situation is they've been – suspect all year long. Steph Curry hasn't. He is still a superstar in this game. And I don't blame Steve Kerr for wanting to protect him and not run him into the ground. I don't blame Steve Kerr for demanding that somebody else step up and show a pulse and show that they could produce. We watched this team coming on this year early, a little bit early in the season. We saw Andrew Wiggins. We said, when's he going to get going? We saw Klay Thompson. He was shooting a career low, 41% from the field, 37% from three-point range, which, by the way, are numbers that most teams would want from a wing player, considering how some of these brothers simply can't shoot. But this is Klay Thompson we're talking about here, one of the top five greatest shooters in the history of game. He's been struggling all year long in terms of consistency. One game he explodes, another game he disappears. That's problematic. Draymond Green, forget the suspension and, and, and his time away. We know that was bad. But we also know that when he's on the court, he elevates them defensively, but he can be a liability offensively. And what we have witnessed now, as far as I'm concerned, is the ascension that nobody's been talking about. Because I got news for you. This is a shocker. It might be a shocker to y'all. I don't give a damn right now about the Golden State Warriors. I care about Steph Curry because he's the greatest shooter God ever created. 
I care about Steph Curry because he's a superstar in this league. And we all know that when that brother's on the basketball court, he's a box office attraction. He makes big things happen. And who knows what he could do in a play-in tournament with a one game on, uh, on the line for the season and a uh, uh, playoff series. We know what Steph Curry can do. He's a four-time champion. But I wanted to take this moment to talk about the Houston Rockets. Who's led by former Celtics coach Ime Udoka. Remember that guy? Remember that guy that I went off about where I said some of you out there are pieces of shit? Remember that? Because this man had a consensual relationship with another adult and somebody out there in Boston, and when I sit up there and I, and, and I get incendiary and I drop a curse word like I just did, I'm talking about somebody in Boston. Who leaked that information? That email you doka. You sitting up there, don't get me wrong, not condoning it. You can't mess around, particularly on a team. What, what was my position back then, ladies and gentlemen, just to regurgitate my point? Fire him or keep him. What you don't do is publicize it like he the only dude that was getting loose in the office. I'm going to repeat what I've said on many, many occasions on national television. I have been covering sports for 30 years. I can't count the amount of screwing around that has gone on in offices. And we ain't never heard about it. I know at least three executives who were fired in the last two years. Because they were getting loose. Nobody knows anything. All anybody knows is that they moved on. You didn't hear anything about their personal business, but folks was ready to throw Ime Udoka under the bus. They wanted his career ruined. They wanted to take this brother out. And then some of you out there don't know how to mind your damn business. Plastic poor Nia Long's face all over the place like she did something wrong. The woman's fine. She's a beautiful actress. She's a great mama. And the whole bit, her personal relationship with him at that time was none of anybody's business. And y'all use that as an opportunity to throw her face into the mix. No regard for her whatsoever because you wanted to ruin Ime Udoka's career that bad. Well, it ain't working. The brother that took the Boston Celtics to the NBA Finals in year one when Brad Stevens, who's a hell of a coach, by the way, and now a hell of an executive for the Boston Celtics, couldn't do it in seven. Ime Udoka did it in year one. And they lost to the Golden State Warriors in the finals because Steph Curry went berserk. He gets axed out, moved out. Joe Mazzula takes over. They lose in game seven of the conference finals after being down 3-0, overcoming the three-game three, three deficit, tying at 3-3, losing in game seven, primarily because Jason Tatum got hurt early in the game. And now Boston's the best team in basketball. And we thought that was also the end of Emery Udoka. Because look at Boston, look at Boston, look at Boston. Well, look at the Houston Rockets. They've won eight straight. Eight straight. They've a, they're a 500 team. And by the way, just so y'all know, in the month of March, the Houston Rockets are 10-1. and one. They lead the NBA in offensive efficiency with 121.5 points per 100 possessions. Defensive efficiency, they're third in the NBA, only behind the New Orleans Pelicans and the Sacramento Kings. They're second in the NBA to the Pelicans in net rating, outscoring opponents by 11 points per 100 possessions. They're third in the NBA in fast break points. Their turnover percentage is the lowest in the NBA. Their pace leads the NBA and steals per game. They're second in the NBA. And by the way, this cat, Jalen Green, is averaging, tied for fourth in the league, averaging 27.8 points, shooting 51% from the field, 42% from the three-point range. The Rockets are coming. And it's because of Ime Udoka. Remember I said that. Remember I said that. I want to take a second to make sure everyone knows that the NBA playoffs are fast approaching, which means every basket, rebound, and assist is important. And I don't know about you, but I need to be in the middle of that action. And how do I do that exactly? I use Prize Picks, the largest fantasy sports platform with more than 3 million members. You see, Prize Picks is not only super exciting, but it's incredibly easy to play, and it takes only 60 seconds to make your picks. All you do is select two or more players from whatever sport you love, the NBA, the MLB, or even the MMA, and then choose more or less of their in-game stats, which means every point, hit, or round will turn into, into big-time cash. 
So if I know that LeBron is dishing out 10 assists or Aaron Judge is hitting two homers, I need to pick that and then play to see that big-time money. So go to prizepicks.com and use promo code SAS for a 100% deposit bonus up to $100. That's right. Go to prizepicks.com. Type in my initials SAS for a first-time deposit match up to $100. That's code SAS when you go to prizepicks.com. Pick more. Pick less. It's really that easy. Let's turn our attention to college basketball for a second, please. Based on the first two games of March Madness, first two rounds, actually, number one seeded UConn men are looking like a good bet to repeat as national champions. All three Big East teams in the field have advanced to the Sweet 16, and all of the number one and two seeds have reached the round of 16 for just the fifth time in tournament history. So that's good. That's very, very interesting, y'all, okay? Let me get this, the, the men's out of the way first because it's important to point this out. I don't give a damn too much about the men this year. I'm not going to front. I don't think anybody could beat UConn. They just look head and shoulders above everybody else. They toyed with Northwestern yesterday. My poor brother, Michael Wilbon, was sitting courtside and stuff like that, got to the game, had on his Northwestern jersey, showed up on CNN prior to the game promoting Northwestern. And I was like, why are you doing this to yourself? And Annihilation is coming, my brother. Do you really want to be a part of this drubbing? And sure enough, before I had an opportunity to pass gas, they were down by 25. I mean, that's the situation. That's the situation. Everybody seems head and shoulders above, or below rather, UConn at this particular moment in time. I did like the North Carolina-Michigan State game. All right? Michigan State put forth a good fight. You know I love me, Tom Izzo. Not just the one that works with me, but the coach that coaches at Michigan State. Bottom line is this, though. I really knew they didn't have a chance. Not with them brothers. Saw Hubert Davis, the coach fired up. The team reacted. Props to them. I watched all of Houston, Texas A&M last night because I picked Texas A&M. I had to pick an upset. I couldn't just go with a bunch of number one seeds. And I thought Houston, who got drubbed by Iowa State in the conference title game, I mean, I just looked at them and I said, you know what? I don't think they're going to do much this year. Then they were running away with it. A minute and 17 was left in the game. They were up 10. Game should have been over. And Texas A&M comes back and ties it and forces it into overtime. So I give them props for that good fight, but ultimately they ended up going home. And you got to give them props where it's due. Marquette, why am I not high on Marquette? I love Shaka Smart. The problem is I've seen them get their ass kicked by UConn too many times this season. And I just believe that ultimately you're not going to be somebody that's going to beat UConn. So I'm not sold on you. Purdue, yeah, you beat up Utah State. What do you want, a cookie? You got the easiest region anybody can point to. Creighton, listen, them beating Oregon, that was, that was good. That was a good one, no doubt about it. Texas and Tennessee, it was good for a while, but Tennessee – just seem to have the number. In the end, I'm just looking at it, guys, and I'm like, ladies, fellas, I don't see anybody beating UConn. But even if that wasn't the case, even if it were a bit more interesting, I have to confess, the women are far more interesting. There's two stories that resonate more than anything, and we need to get over it because it's the absolute positive truth. Is Caitlin Clark going to win the national championship and cement her legacy as one of the greatest female college basketball players ever? I think she already has. Please don't get me wrong. But when you want to compare her or eclipse her over a Cheryl Miller, a Diana Taurasi, or a Brianna Stewart, uh, you know, the list goes on and on. You got to get a championship. I mean, Brianna Stewart won all four years. Down at Tarasi had three titles. Cheryl, uh, I'm sorry, Cheryl Miller had two. You got to get one. Despite the fact you're leading the nation in points and assists, averaging over 32 a game, you still need one title, just one. So watching whether or not Caitlin Clark is going to do it, that's one storyline. You know what the other storyline is? Would they beat LSU in a rematch if they faced one another? Because that's possible. Would they beat LSU? led by Angel Reese and the crew. Would that happen? That's another possibility. And then here's the biggest possibility. I think this is the biggest story in women's college basketball, bigger than Caitlin Clark. LSU versus South Carolina. LSU versus South Carolina. Dawn Staley. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to talk about the greatness. What about Pat Summit, the late great Pat Summit? God rest her soul. Gino Auriemma and what he's done. Kim Mulkey. You know what she's doing at LSU, what she used to do at Baylor. She won three titles at Baylor, won one at LSU last year. Dawn Staley is undefeated in back-to-back -back seasons. Dawn Staley is like 
68 and 1 over the last two years. Dawn Staley is like 105 and 3 over the last three years. I mean, damn. And you saw how South Carolina and LSU got into it. Ladies and gentlemen, that sound right there is supposed to be a leading producer for the podcast that doesn't know how to make sure his equipment is turned off before we go to, to tape it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's just embarrassing. It's just embarrassing. He's got this experience, but somehow he just embarrasses himself like that. I mean, can you believe it? But anyway, I digress. The point is, South Carolina, LSU, SEC Conference, reigning defending national champions, LSU, best team in basketball, South Carolina, led by Dawn Staley. That, to me, is more compelling than the men's game. And the women's game, let me say this because it needs to be said. The women's game has really elevated itself. And I think it's time for the rest of us all to take notice. These women, what's the reason for it? It could be Title IX. I mean, it could be names like Caitlin Clark, Angel Reese, Juju Watkins out of USC, who's a bad sister, Cameron Brink. I mean, it could be a host of all of this stuff. But Title IX, 1972, remember that. Because you're talking about how the act mandated equitable treatment of girls and women in educational institutions that receive federal funds. And so all of a sudden, you got into a situation where what are we talking about here? We're talking about equipment. We're talking about notoriety. We're talking about all of these different things. They have it now. And the women's game, dare I say, is more marketable and is competitive ratings-wise with the men in college basketball. Keep your eyes on this, ladies and gentlemen. This is a dramatic shift that has taken place, and we can't ignore it. Speaking of women, the women's game and staying with it for a second here, break, you know, um, breaking news. I was Caitlin Clark, who I just talked about. She didn't dominate the headlines during the first week of the women's NCAA tournament. That would happen to have been LSU coach Kim Mulkey, who's feuding with the Washington Post newspaper. Um, and that's unfortunately appears to have overshadowed some great action on the court this week. And she began a press conference ahead of, ahead of LSU's tournament opener with this fiery statement here. Listen to this, y'all. This reporter has been working on a story about me for two years. After two years of trying to get me to sit with him for an interview, he contacts LSU on Tuesday as we were getting ready for the first round game of this tournament with more than a dozen questions demanding a response by Thursday, right before we're scheduled to tip off. Are you kidding me? The Washington Post has called former disgruntled players to get negative quotes to include in their story. They're ignoring the 40 plus years of positive stories. This is exactly why people don't trust journalists and the media anymore. It's these kinds of sleazy tactics and hatchet jobs that people are just tired of. I'm fed up and I'm not gonna let the Washington Post attack this university, this awesome team of young women I have, or me without a fight. I've hired the best defamation law firm in the country and I will sue the Washington Post if they publish a false story about me. Now understand, the person that she's talking about is Kent Babb. He's a reporter for the Washington Post who publicly acknowledged that he is working on a piece uh, on Kim Mulkey and the LSU program. Now just for the record, let's put his, his numbers out there, all right, his resume out there. Let's make sure we understand this here about him. He's covered sports for the Washington Post since 2012. He's a winner of numerous national awards by the Associated Press Sports Editor as the nation's best. Author of the book Across the River, Life, Death, and Football in an American City. That was in 2021. And also a book called Not a Game, The Incredible Rise and Unthinkable Fall of Allen Iverson in 2015. The latter was a finalist for the Penn slash ESPN Award for Literary Sports Writing. 
His honors also include Best American Sports Writer 2013, 2018, 2021. This year's Best Sports Writing in 2021, Associated Press Sports Editors Award. First place in feature writing in 2005, 2010, and 2019. We got to give this brother his props because Kim Mulkey put him on blast. She called it a hit job. First of all, congratulations to Kim Mulkey because she got out ahead of the story and tried to control the narrative. So I want to give her props for doing that because that's not something she tends to do. She's usually telling us it's none of our business. She doesn't want to reveal any information. She wants to keep things in house. But clearly this is not something that she wanted to do. So props for her for changing her course of thinking for once. Number two, however, it's not going to work. Um, Kim Mulkey, if you're listening, did you have any idea what you're saying? So you're saying that the reporter approached you right before the NCAA tournament, which was to begin on a Thursday. The reporter approached you on a Tuesday, presented 12 questions to you in the LSU program that they needed answers because it was approaching a deadline. And that wasn't giving you enough time to answer the question. And as a result of that, you're saying that it was a hit job. And purportedly, you felt it's going to be a, you believe it's going to be a hit job because you're familiar with this individual's work because he once did a piece on Brian Kelly at Notre Dame that you felt was a hit job. And so you don't like the man and you told the man you'll never grant him an interview. That's according to reports. But here's what I'm asking you, Kim Mulkey, respectfully, when you... Talk about this man this way. Do you understand that the one dancing is you? The article isn't out yet. We don't know what's going to be said. We know that you're going to sue because you've hired an elite prestigious defamation law firm. We get all of that. But you don't understand the damage you did to yourself when you said the man has been trying to reach you for two years. So if he's been trying to reach you for two years and you refuse to talk to him, and you moaning and groaning about it now, essentially what you're saying is you wanted to dictate his ability to do his job. If his job is to write a story on you and he's been pursuing you for two years trying to interview you, at some point in time, your inaccessibility can't dictate him doing his job, which is to provide a story to the Washington Post about you. Because I assure you, he wouldn't have been working on it this long if the editors and the bosses at the Washington Post didn't mandate that he do so. So you say in one minute, he's been trying to reach you for two years and you wouldn't talk to him, to then turning around and complaining about how he presented you with 12 questions and the LSU program with 12 questions with a limited amount of time to answer it doesn't hold weight. Because you avoided him. And once you avoid somebody, ladies and gentlemen, understand something here. In most instances, you have to accept the consequences. No, it doesn't give somebody a, 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 an excuse to lie on you and to besmirch you and to degrade you and what have you. But if they have discovered facts and you yourself refuse to answer it and either confirm and neither confirm nor deny those facts... That's not his problem. So nice try, Kim Mulkey, that you said what you said. Once again, if you hear noise in the background, it's this elite editor that I have with me that's making all sorts of damn noise. It don't make sense. He can't hold on to a pen, a piece of paper, or nothing. I mean, what the hell's wrong with him today? It's just embarrassing. But I won't get into it too much. In the end, Kim Mulkey, we'll have to wait to see the piece, but you don't have much of an excuse. And, oh, last part. That's very, very important to mention. We weren't really thinking about you that much. On a personal level, we were just looking at your team. We weren't really thinking about you. Until you mentioned the story, you actually brought more eyeballs to this story that's coming out in the Washington Post than I say would have been in existence had you not mentioned it at all. I hope it was worth it. I hope it was worth it. Still to come right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show, there's a few things that I have to address. One would be the former president of the United States, Donald Trump, and his financial issues and his New York fraud trial. The other, however, would be the ongoing rap beef between the one and only Kendrick Lamar, Drake, and J. Cole. Stick around. Don't go anywhere. 
You're watching the Stephen A. Smith Show right here over the digital airwaves of YouTube. Holler at your boy. More in the news. What's up, y'all? The NCAA tournament is in full gear, and I don't know about you, but I need to be right in the middle of all the action. How do I make that happen? I get all my tickets at SeatGeek, of course, because with over 28 million downloads, SeatGeek is the number one rated ticketing app. There are more than 70,000 events on SeatGeek, including sporting events, concerts, festivals, and more. So whether I want to go to the NCAA tournament, the NBA playoffs, or an opening day game in Major League Baseball, SeatGeek has your tickets to whatever you want to see. And that's because they put all the tickets across the web in one place to make sure you're getting the best deal on what you want to do and who you want to see. And I'm coming through with a special offer, so listen up right now. Use my code SAS10, as in the number 10, for 10% off tickets at SeatGeek. That's 10% off any tickets at SeatGeek. That's right. Go now and download the SeatGeek app and use my code SAS10 for 10% off to take advantage of this limited time offer. Make sure you click the link in the description to download the app. Pretty please. Welcome back to the Stephen A. Smith Show right here over the digital airways of YouTube. I'm on vacation, but there's a few shows that I wanted to tape uh, to make sure that I had uh, y'all heard some of my thoughts rather for this week uh, while I'm officially out of the loop during my day during, during my day job. One of the things I wanted to make sure I mentioned was Shohei Otani. Now, he's scheduled to speak sometime this evening. Um, he's not going to be taking questions. Well, that's very, very nice of him to show his face. Quite frankly, it should be a waste of everybody's damn time. No matter what statement he makes, if he's not subjected to any kind of inquiry, then it's nothing more than the statements his lawyers or his team have given over the last few days. Now, that's not to cast any aspersions on him or to attach any level of guilt. But it is to say we need to know whether or not you had anything to do with your interpreter gambling a b he says he never gambled on baseball sure about that c how the hell he get access to your account where wide transfers could be coming to your account i know and we all know publicly that two five hundred thousand dollar wire transfers came from your account which wasn't denied by you or your team and we need to recognize that. But in total, they're saying massive debt, you know, theft has taken place. Because four and a half million dollars was taken from your account. How the hell your interpreter get access to your account to get four and a half million dollars? Ladies and gentlemen, do you know that if I go went to the bank today, I'm Stephen A. Smith. I walk into the bank. You see my face. Do you know how many, how many hoops I have to go through to get $10,000? How the hell you get four and a half million out of somebody else's account when most people got problems getting thousands out of their own account when they have it in their account? It's their account. And literally their face is right there showing up at the damn bank to make the transaction. I'm just saying these are just questions. I don't know the answer. I'm not casting any aspersions, any guilt whatsoever. But I am inquisitive. Because, damn it, I want to know. I want to know what procedural measures were taken to get four and a half million dollars out of somebody else's account when all of us got a problem getting that damn amount of money out of our own. I'm really interested in knowing that. I really, really am. Let me tell you what a lot of you have been expressing a real interest about. And I personally didn't have much interest in this, but I'm a man of the people and I'm a journalist and I follow what's percolating and what have you. And I can't ignore what's been transpiring in the rap game. I mean, hip hop artists, Kendrick Lamar, Drake and J. Cole. All three names. And there's some supposed beef that's going on. What's this about? I mean, when I, when, when I, 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 I'm a decently intelligent man. 
And when I read some of these articles about what's going on, I mean, I got to scratch my head to make sense out of some of this shit. I mean, I ain't going to lie to you. I mean, I'm just struggling with it. Kendrick Lamar made an uncredited appearance. I'm reading from an article in Variety here, by the way. Kendrick Lamar made an uncredited appearance on Future and Metro Boomin's new album, We Don't Trust You. And with it, delivered a series of apparently sharp, pointed words for the one and only Drake and Mr. J. Cole himself. By the way, Wet Dreams is one of my favorite jams, by the way, by J. Cole from years ago. I'm just telling you, you should listen to it. It's kind of fly. You know, it's just kind of fly. Anyway, Lamar, whose fiery verse lights up like that, that's the name of the song, steals the spotlight on the track where he addresses a few bars from Drake and J. Cole's first person shooter included on the former's all for all the dogs you see what i'm saying i mean you gotta know like i know in parentheses that's a song you know what I'm saying? first person shooter. see this is what i'm trying to talk about if you're reading this stuff and you don't follow it it's like it can be very very confusing but nevertheless i'm giving it to you straight from variety on that song which released last year j cole makes mention of the quote big three end quote referring to lamar drake and himself quote Love when they argue the hardest MC. Is it K-Dot? Is it Aubrey or me? We the big three like we started a league. Drake retorted with a bar that could be interpreted as a shot at Lamar, excluding him from the big three designation. Who the GOAT? Who you bitches really rooting for? Like the kid that act bad from January to November. Uses the N-word. It's just you and Cole. On like that, Lamar directly references the rapper's bars and comes gunning for them. Yeah, get up with me. F sneak dissing. First person shooter. I hope they came with three switches. MF the big three. N word is just big me. <sighs> I mean, I hope y'all could stay with that. I had to. I had to read about five times before I could stay with the shit. I, I mean, I, I can't even front. Here's the part, and this is the part that I don't mind really, really getting into and talking about this. Some of you out there may have a problem with it. You really might. I don't. I don't want you shooting one another. I don't want you fighting in the streets. I don't want your boys getting in the tussles with one another. Rap battles, yo, ladies and gentlemen, this, this has been going on since hip hop originated. Remember Big Daddy Kane and LL? You remember Cannabis and LL when Cannabis tried to get himself involved in that mix and LL had to come out, can I bust? Yes, you can. Remember that? Remember that? Who told you to open your mouth? When even Mike, got even Mike Tyson involved? Think about that. This is LL. Big Daddy Kane. KRS-One had beefs. Jay-Z Nas. I mean, it's a whole bunch of stuff that's going into the rap game. It's long as it's lyrical geniuses going up against one another. I'm good with it. I'm good with it. You don't want violence. You don't want too much negativity when you want a brother going broke because somebody else got the best of them. You don't want careers ruined or what have you. But at the end of the day, if I'm a rap artist and I'm battling you, remember 8 Mile? Remember, remember what Eminem was battling all of those brothers? I mean, that was a great part of the movie. But I know something about you. You went to Cranbrook. That's a private school. What's the matter, dog? You embarrassed? This guy's a gangster. His real name's Clarence. I mean, I, mean, I remember all of this stuff. Remember when Empire was on TV? And you had that rap battle going on with him and a girl? That was pretty damn fly. I like stuff like that. That comes with it. We can't overreact to this stuff as long as it doesn't cross the line. As long as it doesn't incite violence and lawless behavior and stuff like that. And it's just brothers showing one another whose skills are superior and ultimately the audience is reacting to it and everybody making money off of it. It's good. Kendrick Lamar is coming out with an album, right? Best believe he's going to make money from it. Future. He did about 30 collabs with Drake from what I read. So what did he let Kendrick Lamar on the album for? Because guess what? It's going to work. Whether they got a real beef or not, whether it's manufactured, I don't know. I don't cover hip hop like that. But I do know this. Because it happened, everybody listening. 
Everybody watching. Everybody reacting. That means everybody going to get paid. And if that in the, at the end of the day is what's going on here, how can we possibly complain about it? Everybody else does it. Hell, I'm getting ready to talk about your former president in a minute. Every time he gets indicted, he asks for more campaign dollars and gets it. And gets it. When you got liberals out there, you know, doing what they doing, you got your own policies. That ain't what you preaching about. You engaging in hate mongering or scare tactics and all of this other stuff to get folks to funnel money into campaigns. It happens all the time. I got a day job. I love doing this. But some of y'all asses out there doing YouTube for money and nothing else. Because you don't want to go out there and get the day job. Everybody trying to get paid. Why are we acting like we don't know? I, I'm, I'm ecstatic that my team is around me right now. I mean, I'm on vacation and they, they came to see me. I, got, they, I appreciate the love. Right up until the moment I write the check and I remind that they ain't here for free. And I know they got love for me, but none of them are here for free. Everybody's looking to get paid. And oh, by the way, I had this looked up because I wanted to make sure that I was on top of this. OK, I got to put on my glasses for this, you know, because I, I got to make sure I'm accurate with what I'm reading right here because I had researchers do this for me. Now, according to Forbes magazine, by the way, they usually do a good job with billionaires and athletes and stuff like that. Not necessarily with actors and artists and stuff like that. Everybody references celebrity net worth as gospel. But the bottom line is. A lot of people question some of those figures, but I looked around on multiple sources because I asked somebody to find me the career, an estimated amount of the career earnings of Drake, J. Cole, Kendrick Lamar and Future, all involved in this story. Drake has made over five hundred million dollars in career earnings. Did you know that J. Cole has made over one hundred and seventy five million dollars in career earnings? Did you know that Kendrick Lamar has made over $200 million in career earnings. And that future is also over $175 million in career earnings. These brothers getting paid. Please don't get in, engage in any violence. Please, please don't engage in any lawless behavior. Don't do that. Let's not encourage that. I don't know Drake and J. Cole and Kendrick to be about that. I don't know future at all, really. I'm sure he's not about that, but I'm saying... They making their money. And if all you arguing about is who's the better rap artist, who's at the top of the throne, ultimately the people decide. And that's all the hell that matters. This beef, whatever you want to call it, I don't look at it as that. I look at it as one brother facilitating another, Willing to go at one another, understanding that it's going to draw a larger audience and everybody's going to get paid. I'm not saying there's no beef. I'm not saying it's completely manufactured. I'm not trying to question the authenticity of any of these brothers. I don't know them. But I know they gifted. I know they skilled. And I know they've proven it with their career earnings they've already earned on their own. Which means they know a thing or two about marketing. Which means that at least some of this. Is on purpose. I'm here for it. Because they're using their music to do it. They ain't just talking trash. They're using their music to do it. Which means we all going to want to hear. And we all benefit. You're watching the Stephen A. Smith Show right here over the digital airwaves of YouTube. The state of New York is looking bad. And it's going to continue to look worse specifically like a bunch of suckers if they keep flowing on the path that they're flowing on. And it ain't just New York, it's a few other states as well. What am I talking about? I'll get into all of that and more in a minute. Your tweets, of course, up next as well. You're watching the Stephen A. Smith Show over the digital airways of YouTube. Back with more in a minute. 
Okay, everybody, you know what time it is. It's time for Stephen A's Weekly Picks. You see, I've teamed up with Prize Picks to bring you my favorite picks for every big-time game or sporting event. Prize Picks, in case you didn't know, is a skill-based, real-money daily fantasy sports game where you select two or more players and predict if they'll have more or less than their stat projections for the game. It's not only super exciting, but incredibly easy to play and takes only 60 seconds to make your picks. Pick the stats for Caitlin Clark, Dak, Juan Soto, or even Coco Golf, and then sit back and just watch. So go to prizepicks.com and use promo code SAS for a 100% deposit bonus up to $100. You heard me. Go to prizepicks.com, type in my initials SAS to get a first time deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's really that easy. Now let's look at today's winning picks, please. First up, Jalen Green for the Houston Rockets. More or less, 35 and a half points, rebounds, assist for the game. The number is 35 and a half. Combine those three stats, points, rebounds, assists. Will he get more or less? You see the Houston Rockets and the way they've been playing? When is Vase straight vying for a playing spot? Excuse me, I'm going with more. That's an easy one right now. Next up, San Antonio Spurs star, rookie star, future rookie of the year, imminent rookie of the year, Victor Wembignana. More or less than 37 and a half points, rebounds, assist. More. He's Victor Wimbiana. Okay? They should have thrown block shots up in there too. He'll have a few of those. But 37 and a half points with rebounds and assist match, combining all of those numbers. Yeah, he's got that kind of game. He can do that. Let's go to New York Knicks star point guard Jalen Brunson. More or less 39 and a half points, rebounds, assists. I'm going with more. Very simple for me to do that. You see the way he's been playing? And I still contend. If Mitchell Robinson and Julius Randle come back and can stay healthy along with OG Ananobi, I believe the New York Knicks, at least once upon a time, are going to the finals. But now Russ might kick in, so I don't know. But I believe in this brother Jalen Brunson, I'll tell you that much. And I'm going with more on the 39 and a half. Jason Tatum for the Boston Celtics. More or less than 40 and a half points, rebounds, assists. Well, he's averaging 27.8 points per game in the month of March. So you're talking about rebounds and assists. You just need an additional 13. I'm going to give him that. He's an MVP candidate. He's one of the best players in basketball. He's playing for the best team in basketball. He's that dude that's going to get about 350 to $375 million when his contract negotiations come up. So the bottom line is more, and it's more on all of them. Jalen Green, Victor Wimbiana, Jalen Brunson, Jason Tatum. More, 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 more. Listen to your boy Stephen A. I don't lie to you about these things, in case you haven't noticed. Welcome back to the Stephen A. Smith Show right here over the digital airways of YouTube. Before I get on out of here with your tweets, I just wanted to touch on this particular story because it involves former President Trump and New York Attorney General Letitia James. This is the political news I wanted to touch on. It's where former President Donald Trump got a break today. An appeals court ruled Trump will not have to immediately post a bond of more than $454 million in the civil fraud case against him and his company. The court ruled Trump can delay the payment of the full bond for now while he appeals the case under the condition that he posts a $175 million partial bond within seven day, within 10 days, I'm sorry. The February 16th judgment against the 2024 GOP nominee is one of four trials Trump is facing heading into the election. In this one, he's charged with manipulating his net worth and his family real estate company's property values to dupe lenders and insurers. This morning, Trump wrote on his Truth Social that the number the judge set was, quote, fraudulent and tweeted, it should be zero. I did nothing wrong. Needless to say, Letitia James had her own version of things long before Trump spoke this morning. In February, after the ruling to pay the $454 million, this is what she had to say. Everyone must play by the same rules. We have a responsibility to protect the integrity of the marketplace. And for years, Donald Trump engaged in deceptive business practices and tremendous fraud. Donald Trump and the other defendants were ordered to pay $463.9 million. That represents $363.9 million in disgorgement, plus $100 million in interest which will continue to increase every single day. You see, ladies and gentlemen, I understand on one hand, you can perceive her as just doing her job. And I'm not going to lie to you. If you're a sister 
a black woman in that position, I'm inclined to give you the benefit of the doubt because I want to. But that doesn't mean I always can. And in this particular situation, since you came into the job declaring your fixation on taking the former president down, and you see some of the things that's transpiring. I actually think Letitia James got a break today because if the judge had ruled that Trump's properties could be seized because he couldn't post bond on a four hundred and fifty four million dollars and you saw chains wrapped around the doors of Trump Plaza or any of his properties, he would have used it for his campaign. He would have used it to galvanize the troops to make everybody know that guess what? This dude, right? these people right here are trying to take me down. They're trying to manipulate the campaign. They know they can't beat me. So they're engaging in lawfare because they can't beat me straight up in the campaign. They're trying all of these criminal charges to throw against me, whether it's criminal or civil, it doesn't matter. Anything they can to compromise me, to distract me, to avert, to avert having to go up against me. That's what they want to do. And ladies and gentlemen, tens of millions of people would have agreed with them. The worst thing that the state of New York or Georgia or any place, anybody has a case against Donald Trump. There are four, there are, there are four indictments, 91 counts, at least initially from months ago, that were against him. All of these things that have been going on, all of these court cases, there are two different court cases in New York today alone. All these things that have been doing, they've been doing. He's still the GOP nominee, the presumptive GOP nominee. He's ahead in the polls against Biden. The momentum has shifted in his direction. And I couldn't agree with noted pollster the one and only Frank Lutz, days ago, when he had this to say about the possibility of Trump's properties being seized and the kind of impact it would have absolutely positively had on his campaign for the presidency of the United States. Let me, let me, let me show it to you for yourself. Read it for yourself. There it is. Franklin said it best. It would be the worst, most stupidest thing the left could possibly do. And it would end their chances of knocking off Trump and winning the presidency again. Trump had cameras at the ready, I believe. If they had voted against him, if they had not elected to grant him that 10 day reprieve to come up with one hundred and seventy five million dollars. If they had done something along those lines, ladies and gentlemen, I promise you. They had to pay the price. He had went up in the polls and he had more campaign dollars in his coffers. And by the way, his truth social platform, they saying that's going to be like. Worth like six billion and three billion for him which means he's expected to have the money to pay. You know how that happens, ladies and gentlemen? When you're running for the presidency of the United States and you got a chance to win, people line up to do you favors because they're expecting a return on their investment. If anyone knows how to milk that, it's Trump. Haven't you learned that by now? If you hadn't, or haven't, you should be ashamed of yourself. Before I get on out of here, let me go to the tweets. Uh, because, like, folks love to tweet at me, so I appreciate that. TGA Fridays. At TGA Fridays tweets me, Stephen A., what would be your dream appetizer sampler if you can only pick three appetizers? Clearly, buffalo wings. Fried with blue cheese on the side. Some calamari would be nice. And some cheeseburger sliders. Either that or chicken sliders. But I'd say the cheeseburger sliders because I got picked the chicken to begin with. Buffalo wings. Those would be my three. Next up. At GTC901. Right, Stephen A., can you catch more flies with honey or more honeys being fly? More flies with honey. You catch some honeys being fly. I mean, I, some would argue I might know a thing or two about that. 
You could catch. You could catch. Honey's being fly. But do you see how many flies flock to actual honey? Any man that tells you that he can handle that kind of onslaught is lying. The only person I've ever given credence to, to making such a, 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 an assertion was Will Chamberlain when he talked about those 20,000 women he was with. He was in L.A. It did span 20-plus years in L.A. and Philadelphia and San Francisco, stuff like that. I mean, damn. And you saw how buck wild L.A. was. Hell, how buck wild L.A. is. So you know how bad it was back then. I believe Will Chamberlain had 20,000 women. I believe quite a few folks who will remain nameless that starred in the NBA had 20,000 women. But that still don't mean that being fly can pull more flies than honey can. I'll move on. Next up, at major underscore solos, he writes, my question, Stephen A., to you is this. Who you got winning one versus one, Minecraft Steve or Goku? Is that how I pronounce it, Goku? From Dragon Ball Z, I'm going, I'm, uh, you know, I'm going with Goku from Dragon Ball Z. I like him. First of all, he looks like he on fire. He don't look cold. He looks like he hot, ready to do some things. So I'm going to go with him, all right, and... and they both got hops. I get that. But at least Goku looks like he's got feet. The other one doesn't. Sorry, Minecraft Steve. Where's your feet at? I'm not going with you. Last one right here. Let's go to the last one. At Deadman underscore PT3. Stephen A., what's happening, brother? The theme for my daughter's first birthday is fairies. However, her mother asked me to dress up as, a, as Shrek. I called her crazy and said she lost her mind. We are now at odds. Do I cave in and put on that fat suit or stand my ground? Please advise. Dead man underscore PT3. You might be the dumbest ass that ever tweeted me in my life. I mean, seriously. I, I mean, I'm not even joking. You might be the dumbest ass I've ever seen. So you're not going to put on a Shrek suit that would please your baby girl for her first birthday? That'll make her laugh? You're not going to put on a Shrek suit that would please her mama, who's clearly your woman. Don't you like bed, your bed being warm at night? So you're going to alienate the two most important women in your life because you don't want to put on a fat suit for your daughter's first birthday? You ain't a fool. You're a new fool. You don't deserve no loving whatsoever. You got to change your ways, my brother. Don't you want your baby girl to be a daddy's girl? Don't you want to do things like that for her so she can remember the smile you put on her face? And she's like, daddy, don't you want her mama happy? So when it's time for you to get some loving, which you clearly need some of, by the way, because you're clearly not that experienced because experienced men would know better than to ask a dumbass question like this. Get it together, bro. Seriously, get it together. I'm so disgusted, I'm ending the show on that. I don't even want to talk to y'all no more. Because at deadman underscore PT3 is an idiot that I need to get his act together so he can understand that ain't nothing better than loving from your woman. Remember my guy I told you about, my producer that was making all noise and dropping stuff around and all that other stuff? That's why he was dropping his stuff. Because his woman was giving him loving over the phone. And he was fantasizing about the loving he going to get later. I won't say his last name, but his first name is Galen. Just want y'all to know that. Y'all have a nice evening. Stephen A. signing off until next time. Peace and love.